What up? It's me, JJ. Doing things today. Wow. Wow. Must be the golden hour because I look great. So today I wanted to talk about my favorite movies and I was going to do them. I was going to do five, but then I thought of a six and I was like, well, screw that. I'm doing six because that one is just as good as the rest of these. I'm thinking I'll do these in order of when they were released. Okay, so my first favorite is Breakfast at Tiffany's. That's what it looks like. It has Audrey Hepburn, Everyone's Bay, including mine. Um, but I love this movie because... I think it has a really timeless message about relationships and love and stuff because the main character, Holly Golightly, has been running away from a lot of stuff for her whole life. Um, some of it very crappy um, and warranted to be ran away from. Um, but when she finally does end up in a good relationship, she tries to run away from that too. And the man in the relationship tries to control her. And he says, I love you, you belong to me. She says, no, I don't belong to anybody. People don't belong to other people. And I think that changes their dynamic in a really, like, positive, healthy way. But I would watch this in high school when I had hella insomnia. And a lot of times I would fall asleep before the end of the first scene because it was just such a comfort to me. And, yeah. So, movie number two is The Secret Garden. Which, I've also read the book, and the book is, oh my gosh, so good. Such a good book. Um, I think they did a really good job adapting this movie. I don't say that a lot. I reserve that for very few movie adaptations, but this, I think they captured the spirit of the book so well. But anyway, it's about this little girl, she's like 10, I think, who her parents die. She like lives in India and it's during the British occupation of India and stuff and her parents die and <clears throat> she ends up having to move back to England um, because her closest living relative who's an adult is her uncle. So her mom's twin sister's husband um, which that is actually quite important that it's her mom's like twin sister and stuff. But yeah, it's her uncle, and she's just this little contrite kid and stuff, and she's always so sour and stuff, um, but by the end of the movie, she's just this emotionally intelligent, beautiful, happy kid, and it's just such a message of redemption and growth and, um, like, friendship. Um, and the way they tell the story visually is just super well done and there's um a st stop motion time lapse like part in the middle where some plants are growing and that's just really well done and th the visual of how they tell the story so like it starts out very gray and it's in the middle of the english winter and stuff and by the end of the movie as you can see like on the cover it's so green and i think this movie is part of what made me fall in love with nature. I would also recommend the book because it is just such a good book. Um, but if you only have two hours to spend on something, the movie is very good too. Okay, so the next one I have is the short version of Pride and Prejudice. I do also like the long version. I feel like the story is well adapted in this shorter version. Um, I really like the fil the art of the film in this version, and the costuming in this one is really good, and I just don't always have time, eight hours to commit to watching Pride and Prejudice. So, you know, if you don't know about Pride and Prejudice, that is your loss, A, and B, go watch it, because <laughs> it's just a cultural thing, you know? It's like part of our culture at this point. This one also, this version also has beautiful music. It has one of my favorite movie soundtracks, like, ever. And it's mostly piano based, which I am a sucker for piano because I took, like, 
years of piano lessons. So the next movie, number four, I think, um, is Iron Man 3. Yes, the third one. I also love the first two Iron Man movies just because I love Tony Stark. A lot of people disagree with me on this, but I relate to him an embarrassing amount. And I'm not going to get into that right now, but I think his struggle with anxiety in this movie is really relatable. I think that it is really well done for a third movie. Uh, I just love it, and I love it, and I love it. It's Mad Max. <sighs> okay, so first of all, th the main character says like a ten words the whole movie, except for the opening monologue, and he communicates mostly in grunts, which I think is relatable, um, and also, I don't know, there are people who have a hard time talking, and that is a thing that needs representation, whether it's a hard time talking because of a disability, or just because they don't like talking and they don't find it easy to, like, communicate their ideas to other people. Also, the wives, all of them, are my favorite. They are all, they all care for each other so much, and they are all strongly developed characters, even though I, like, maybe one or two of them have actual names, but you can tell. You can, you know what their deal is. After you've watched this movie, you're like, oh, it's that wife. I know what, what, what's up with her, and I know, like, what makes her tick and stuff. Which is amazing, because there are like five of them, in addition to Tom Hardy and Charlize Theron. And oh, Furiosa. <sighs> she doesn't let anything stop her, ever. And when she finds out that the green place isn't a thing anymore, She's just like, okay. Like, obviously she has an emotional reaction, which is such an emotional moment in the movie. But she has her emotional reaction, lets it live within her, and then takes action, which I think is so strong and it's such a good example of a strong person and a strong woman and uh, um and man that ending is just so perfect it feels so right it feels uh, endings have to feel right in addition to being right it, it's like what JK Rowling did with Harry Potter where everything is circular. That's how this feels. It feels like a circular story. And it makes sense. It's like when they make a joke in a sitcom at the beginning of a scene and then at the very end of the scene they'll have that last punchline that brings the joke back that they haven't mentioned in five minutes. That's what that kind of a circular ending feels like. It feels like holy wow, they did that, and wow, that was really well done and really well written. So the last two, I have a digital copy of one, and one, uh, I do not. <laughs> so the last two, um, Star Wars Episode Eight, duh. <laughs> so many reasons. I felt like it was a new, fresh story that also was able to bring back in elements of the original trilogy without being overly nostalgic or copying. It feels like a new version of a good story that I want to hear again and again and again. And I love these new characters and I can't wait to see what they do next. And 
I just feel like it's a callback to the Star Wars that I grew up with and the Star Wars that I knew and loved. And I feel like Rey is a really good foil for Luke, where she is not the same as him, but similar enough to where the contrast drawn is interesting. I have lots of thoughts on that, can you tell? Can you tell? I don't know why everyone is so cares so much about why, who her parents are. Because I think it is a more compelling story when she is someone who comes from God knows where and God knows what. It was compelling in the original trilogy for Darth Vader to be Luke's dad because it was an interesting plot twist, but I don't think they could pull off that same plot twist. So why would it matter who her parents are? Just my onion. Last one, of course, is Civil War. And if you haven't seen it yet, spoilers ahead, stop now. Um, but It was just so good! There was so much packed into that movie. I felt so compelled by every character's line of reasoning for doing what they did. Obviously we can't, we can't blame Bucky for the thing, but it did happen. You know, it's like, you know, you hit somebody's car on the interstate Insurance is still gonna bill you, not them. Obviously, Tony's gonna be messed up about that. But I think what people disagree more on not not is not Tony being upset about his parents' death because anyone would be upset by that. <laughs> but is Tony's original reason for signing the Accords, which I don't understand. The Tony that we know and the Tony that has been coming back for all the Iron Man movies and the Avengers movies is a Tony that I firmly believe would sign those Accords because of his firm belief that he does not want to be involved in people's death. He wants to protect people because, you know, he had a turnaround and I don't know, I feel like people don't like that he's consistent or something, but I find that very relatable to stick to your guns even if Captain America disagrees with you because, let's face it, Captain America is like the most I feel like he's the most reasonable, <laughs> but also the most, like, he has the best values of all the Avengers, is what I think. Um, but Tony sticks to his guns anyways because he believes in what he's gonna believe in. And that's exactly what Cap does, but Tony's the one who everyone's critical about. I don't know. I'm not up for that. That's what I'm saying. Those are my faves. Uh, yeah. Lots of things happening in this video. <laughs> if you liked it and like movies, please click like. Uh, please hit subscribe because more is coming your way. I don't just do makeup videos. I do many other things.